So with that, Chris, you know, there are questions arising. I brought it up in the last show. Um, you know, Matthews, I, he didn't look great, but you feel like with him, you can figure it out. Uh, what I saw from Mitch Marner to me personally was a guy that disappeared. Uh, the style of play just did not suit his style of play. He's an incredible perimeter player, but this is a guy that never, never drives the net. I understand that's not his style. I understand that he's made a career and makes $11 million doing that. Good for him. But my question is, does Mitch Marner have the ability to perform in the playoffs? He hasn't scored a goal in 18 playoff games. Um, does he have the shot to do it? And, and, and frankly, you know, people are able to out physical him in the playoffs. And I hate to make it about that. I understand from a stats perspective, especially an analytics perspective, the value that Mitch Marner has, and I'm a Mitch Marner fan, but what I saw was a guy that completely disappeared and then got really nervous. I mean, Arpen Basu's tweet, I think before game six or game seven kind of said it all said, Mitch Marner is nervous. I have never seen him like this. I think it was mid game seven. Mid games, whatever. Oh, no, I think it was pregame, wasn't it? I don't know. Anyway, is- long story short, you know, can, you know, can Mitch Marner do this? Is he capable of this? Does he have to change anything up? How do you think he looks at going into this summer? Because the focus seems to be on him mostly with Leafs Nation. The question is fair, but I, I really do believe he can figure it out. Honestly, right. his whole life he's been small, right? Like, and he was dominant when London won the Memorial Cup. I get it. Not the same thing. We're talking so, about men, yeah. different stage. But I would still be betting on him if I were the Leafs, and I think that's why they're comfortable doing so. There's no question that when the dust settles on this, like Mitch Marner wasn't right these last two weeks. You know, I can only guess at everything going wrong, the pressure, what's being said, maybe just the fact he's trying really hard and it's not working, and he doesn't. He, he's almost out of answers. He's frustrated. You know, he wasn't himself. He wasn't dynamic. I don't think it was a lack of care or, or anything. It just, it, the execution wasn't there. And I do think when the dust settles, like this is still a very emotional time. He's just getting, you know, he's being raked over the coals, frankly. And that's fine. I'm not saying it's unfair, but like, I think when, once the motions of this pass, because this too shall pass, just like everything we all deal with good and bad in our lives, he's got it. He has to have some honest reflection. I think the organization, the coaching staff, management have to talk with them and they have to they have to make a plan for why it'll be different next time and and things he can do because there are things he can do i mean on any ice sheet he's on he's basically the most skilled player and again i think he's wired for success i don't think he's a guy that's doing too much else in his life like he's playing some video games maybe a little golf in the summer a bit of cottage time but like he eats sleeps breathes hockey he has his whole life and i just think he's still young enough that i I wouldn't make too many dramatic conclusions based on these 12 days or even, you know, what happened in the bubble last year or the year before against Boston. Like it's the criticism is fair. He goes 18 games without a goal in in the playoffs. Like people are going to bring that up and they're going to question this and they're going to doubt him. Like it's up to him. Now people have doubted him again because of his size for a long time. It's up for him to push back against that, to make sure he's doing everything he needs to this summer. And I do think some honest self-reflection about what happened here. And this is where it's hard for me to comment too closely because I, I really don't know everything that was going on behind the scenes or in his mind, but we all saw, you, you couldn't deny that it wasn't the same player. Mm-hmm. And I think when it really started going sideways, it went sideways. And, you know, with Mitch, I always feel like anything that doesn't work, it's almost a product of caring too much. It's not the opposite where he's just like, yeah, whatever. Um, you know, I think, I think he really wants to, to find a way and, and, I, I'm giving it at least one more year before a, a playoff hockey in these kind of circumstances before I'm making those kind of conclusions. There what do you, two, oh, sorry. Go oh, ahead. I, was, I just want to know what, you, what do you make of the, the pile on that kind of happened afterwards uh, after game seven, specifically the, uh, the reporting of the power play, him not wanting to play down low. And then the, uh, the viral, he was playing golf the next day. Did you, did you have any takeaways from those two, those two instances? I found the whole thing a little ridiculous. I know he wasn't playing golf. <laughs> that one I know isn't true. You know, and I don't even if he was, was if cares? he was, who cares? Like, yes, that's also true. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, man, we look the social media world. Like I still struggle with it. Like I love so much of it, but it got, it got nutty out there, man. Mm-hmm. It got crazy. Like actually 
when I walked outside the building after game seven, I was doing a TV hit in Maple Leaf Square with Sean McKenzie, my sports set colleague. And there was a, a young man in a Marner jersey. He's like, I'm leaving this year. And he like ran over and left it on uh, Legends Row there. And he was trying to, get the, try, trying to get the cameras to film him. I, I'm sure some did. I didn't see the footage. I just saw it live. Oh, gee. You know, people were angry and they just, they don't know where to put their anger, I guess. Uh, but this is, you know what? The flip side of this, this is this is what it is to be on a big big league team in a big city where people care. So, you know, I, I think it's awful. You know, I don't like anything that's directed in terms of a threat towards his family, anyone coming to his house or anything like that. I think that stuff is nonsense. But I mean, look, there's going to be criticism, and and I think that should be expected too. The PowerPoint thing is interesting. Like, I, I think that there might be a kernel of truth to it, as far as I can tell, like a small kernel in that. My understanding is he prefers to play the spot he played on the power play, which makes sense. He's been there a long time. Sure. Um, but I, I don't know. I can't remember how it was characterized. I don't think he like refused or, you know, I think that maybe, you know, the fact that that stuff comes out right after a game seven, it just feels like you wonder about the motives of everything going on. I'm not even saying with the intellect, um, you know, reporting it then. It's like, who's telling him that, that, then and why, you know what I mean? It just feels feels a little dirty to me you know the least power play struggled for months you know <laughs> why why is that coming out that the minute after game seven again i'm not blaming ian necessarily but who's telling him that and why and why was it characterized i think in the worst way possible that isn't reflective of reality and and you know man there's just a lot of shit when your team loses so, so then with that chris um you know, that is a, a bone of contention with Leafs Nation that sort of got lost in in the fallout from Game 7. Uh, one of the things we talked about on the last show was if that rumor were true, um, part of it would make sense, not in the sense that that sounds like a Mitch Marner thing to do because it doesn't. Um, but it, what, what was interesting was that it seemed that they didn't really make any adjustments. Power play dries up and they continue to throw out and do the same thing. And... A lot of fans, rightly so, laid that at the feet of Manny Malhotra um, and obviously the players on the ice. There's a lot of people who are upset that Joe Thornton was consistently out there when William Nylander was an absolute monster in the series. Um, what do you make of how much of how much of that lays at the feet of the coaching staff? And will there be changes with the assistant coaches? It doesn't seem as if there, though there are going to be changes, at least to start the offseason, although you know, it might be a little too soon to say. They might not have made that that judgment just yet. You know, what I make of it is I actually made tons of adjustments, but what's strange is that it wasn't until that final power play in game seven, when you had Sheldon Keefe down at the front of the bench, sort of diagramming a play for them that they put William Nylander on the opposite flank to Austin Matthews, kind of the way they played in their rookie season and had some success. Like they waited. That was the one change they didn't do for an awfully long amount of time. But if you look back to the regular season, like they, they were going load up one unit, split them between two units. You know, Rasmus Sandin got his, his turn on the top power play unit, both late in the regular season and in the playoffs. Like, I feel like they tweaked a lot. It just, none of it to any great effect. And it doesn't make sense that this team can't find a way with the power play. Like, like but this, this has been to an be issue. a huge priority. Because, yeah, you're right. Down the stretch uh, last season, too, Yeah, it was an issue for them. And it, 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 you watch what Colorado is doing right now, or even Boston, like those teams whip it around, you know, Edmonton, obviously McDavid's a cheat code, but still Tampa, they, they, they those, those teams all, they, they make it so that it like, they're so skilled that you can't help but take penalties against them because they're so good. And then they, they make you pay for doing that. And the, the thing with Montreal who had, you know, a little bit more of a thuggish type approach to this series, they want, you know, phys- being physical is how they're built. That's what they wanted to do. There was, there's a little bit less fear, I think about crossing the line because, the Leafs really didn't make them pay. I know they ended up scoring, I think, three power play goals in the series. But, you know, again, they were one of the – I think they were 13th of the 16 teams when I looked in the playoffs. Like, if they were the top power play in the league in the playoffs, they're still playing in the second round. There's just no way around that. And, and yeah. it's my instinct to say to you, but, yeah, 
like the the low percentage is the difference of what one or two goals, and then I just look at that series and I'm like, Jesus, do you win the oh, series? You, you have one, <laughs> one, you have oh, one you or two it. goals. Like, what? and and Chris, uh, well, go back to game is, one, guys. And game one was so weird, right? The John Tavares yeah. thing was scary and awful. Yeah. But they have a power play in the third period of a one-one game, and what do they do? They give up the shorthanded goal to Byron. Like, yeah. if they score there instead of giving up the shorthanded goal, you know, they're up one nothing. Maybe they sweep the series. Like, maybe they still win the next three games. Like, Ugh. I realize you, you're you're playing the coulda woulda shoulda but they were one shot away in that game they were one shot away in game five and one shot away in game six and even game seven they didn't get blown out they just didn't have anything left but i i i think sorry what i meant by the the tweaks is that it seemed like yes they they changed people in and out and and i don't know why they would have waited till the last power play of the whole damn season to put nylander in there i think i think if we learned anything you got to put the best players together to score a fucking goal but especially when you need one goal (laughs) when you need one goal but the other thing is, is mm. it's this. It seemed, Chris, like the way they play the power play, in terms of the system itself. Um, the only guy that I really saw, I mean, Tavares would be a guy that would be in tight. Uh, William Nylander is a guy that scores a, go- a ton of goals in tight. Wayne Simmons scores goals in tight, but he was unfortunately he was very effective at the beginning of the season. Then had the injury. Then it just never seemed to come back for him. Um, the the way they played that just never seemed to click. And I wonder, um, and I know that they are these guys. I mean, we saw it with Cody CC last year. They're hard on their, like they're hard to, they're hard to move off their guys once they have their guys. But um, there is no excuse for this there. And you know, it's like, you know, the Lakers are out. You need LeBron to be um, you need LeBron to be performing at least uh, you know, you, you, the, the Clippers, same thing with Kawhi with that air, you know, the air ball, like you need, yes, you got to have supporting cast, but if this, if this team doesn't score from its, its, its star players in a position to score, I don't know. Like I, I don't, I didn't see a lot of driving the net. I heard that they were tougher. I heard that they were grittier, but when you go on the power play, there's like the one thing that the Leafs power play has lacked is James Van Riemsdyk for a couple of years. And as much as he was a problem and the contracts a problem in Philly, man, when he was on that power play in front of the net, tipping things all the time, they were pretty dominant. And it he hasn't magic. been the same since. He was magic down there. His hands oh. are ridiculous. Yes. You know, they have to rip it up and start again. I mean, you have, you have the best pure shooter in the world and you have tons <laughs> of other players with high, high end, you know, offensive abilities. You can't tell me that there's not a way to make that work. But you're right. The system didn't work. I think the problem, of course, which more than just me identified, on the top unit, they really have the one guy who shoots, who scares you. So you just fade Matthews. I think that that's why it makes sense with Nylander because Nylander has a low-key ridiculous shot. You know, we don't – it's funny. He scores so many goals from in tight, like even at five-on-five, you don't see him, like, really cock it up anymore sometimes. But, like, he he can fire the puck. And so I think that – that you probably get back to having at least Matthews and Nylander build a unit around the fact that both those guys can shoot and pass. And that gives you deceptive options. Yeah. I'm curious what we'll see from Rasmus Sandy next year. I assume he's going back to top power play duty in a full season. You know, I guess if there's any hope in all this for fans, like once this wears off, like they're probably going to be better next year. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that that's like false. I'm not expecting anyone to be fired up about that, but like they're going to, I think that they will come back with different players and a different approach. And there's every chance they're even more dangerous. Um, but the power play, it's like the, the margins are so fine in a series, like the one they played with Montreal, like you almost can't lose this series. They scored four more total goals. They got a better save percentage from the goalie, more high danger chances, more scoring chances, more shot attempts, more unblocked shot attempts, more shots on goal. Like they did Everything but win, and I. I not... <laughs> oh, that's true. No one Look wants to up. hear that. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you couldn't lose a series like that. Like, only only, <laughs> only few teams could lose a series with those kind of lines.